We have got for you, I'm Charlie Beckett, you may have seen me earlier, I run Polis, I'm based here at the LSE, I'm of no consequence in this session, but I'm delighted to have three people uh, that we've done events with before actually, I've been working with uh, on the far left in a minute, Ruud Beerman, who um, I've been working with him on an EBU, European Broadcasting Union research project looking at the future of public service media, Ruud cares, cares about that because he's a veteran uh, public service TV uh, broadcasting executive from the Netherlands who's now working with EB on this future project. Um, Silla Benko is a director general. She's director general of uh, Swedish Radio, uh, which is uh, one of the most innovative uh, public sector broadcasters I know of in terms of its work with uh, social media uh, as a way of doing its journalism, but also as a way of connecting to uh, its different audiences in Sweden. So Silla's going to talk about that and the role of trust in it. And Trisha Barrett, who is, I don't know what your official title, but you handle that user-generated uh, content stuff uh, in this sort of social media hub that Mary Hockaday was mentioning earlier at the heart of the BBC newsroom. And he's going to be showing a couple of examples around verification, getting things right. So, with no more... From me, Ruud, really going to come up and present, then Scylla's going to present, and then Trusha's going to present, and there'll be, we hope, a little bit of time at the end for you to ask some questions. Go. Okay, I will... Hello, everybody. Um, I will talk about Vision 2020, which is a new project of EBU and the position of trust in that, very briefly. And then I would like to share with you six examples of how a public service broadcaster can strengthen his position or her position, I'm not sure about that. Uh, as being a trusted source. Since Charlie uh, said to me that he will keep track of time, I have to be very fast, so I will skip a few things along the way. Forgive me for that. But first, uh, the next slide, please. The question is, uh, this is about the project and uh, this uh, speech. The next one, please. Um, can you trust a guy talking about trust coming from Holland? Because <laughs> Holland is the country where they export veal but next slide, please. <laughs> it's, in fact, horse meat. <laughs> um, and uh, it's also the country where one of its famous writers said the following recently on the meat scandal. We, the people, want to be cheated, but it feels a lot better when we are cheated with veal, next slide, please, than with horse meat. <laughs> and uh, it's quite clear that I don't belong to this church. Uh, I'm from Public Service Broadcasting. I believe very much in the search for truth, the ambition at least, and in, in integrity and uh, the search for objectivity in the end. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this is to show that I worked at Public Service Broadcasting, so we can skip that. Uh, this is the project Vision 2020. It's a new project at the EBU. It's the first time all the members of the EBU engage in an ambitious project like this. Um, it's about uh, uh, finding answers on, uh, let's say, the changes in the media landscape in Europe and the impact it will have on public service media. And of course, this is propelled by the fact that a lot of EBU members are under pressure. Um, next slide, please. The basic question we want to answer is how to be indispensable in the eyes and ears of our audiences and stakeholders. So it's about perception in the end. It's not on what you think yourself. And uh, the question is how we do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we started a few months ago with analyzing trends, of course. The next step is what impact will they have on uh, uh, public service media. We will uh, try to speak with people inside and outside public broadcasting about uh, uh, what role in the future that there will be for public service media. Uh, are there new ideas on this? Um, and I can tell you, uh, it's a complex journey. It will take about a year from now on. We have three expert groups uh, composed out of members, and one of them is headed by Charlie, uh, trying to find uh, best practices and recommendations. In the end, it will not be uh, um, one scenario or one answer or um, uh, one strategy. It will be, hopefully, a toolbox of ideas and best practices on uh, uh, changes you can uh, decide for yourself and every member has to propose his own strategy out of these ideas. That's the ideal. 
Um, how would such a toolbox looks like? Look like? And I made a next slide, please. A small uh, a, a draft uh, sketch for myself. Um, what you see on the inside are the values. On the circle, you see a number of activities and issues that a public service broadcaster can, and in my opinion, should work on. And on the outside, you see the impact uh, a public broadcaster can have in society. Um, because of time, I will not. Uh, but the idea is, yeah, basically, if you work consistently from the values and you do the right thing on these uh, issues and activities, and you do this consistently over the years, the chance that you are uh, winning the hearts and minds of the audience and that you are uh, uh, indispensable is growing. There's no guarantee, of course. In the next slide, I try to uh, address where trust is involved, because this is the uh, issue we are talking about here. And as you see, there's a lot of blue. Um, it, in, in fact, it means that uh, trust is um, and, and being reliable is not only about the programs, as you see on the right side, but it's also about the institution. Um, today, uh, uh, um, I think quite some EBU members, public service broadcasters, uh, enjoy a high level of trust. Um, and the question is, uh, uh, will that stay that way? And um, I have a bold statement that helps in the debate here, I think. Next slide, please. Uh, my answer would be, there is a, a big role, provided you do your homework. Um, and why I, am I optimistic? At least in daytime, at nighttime, sometimes <coughs> I think differently. But um, coming from a country where public service broadcasting is heavily hit by budget cuts, as some of you know, probably. Um, there are three reasons I would like to mention here. First of all, the need for a trusted source is, uh, is growing. It's not uh, diminishing. And if you look at some of the trends, uh, maybe that will explain why I'm saying this. I think if you look at the European societies, they are getting more and more complex. And that asks for, I would say, uh, 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 better analysis by journalists. The second one is the erosion of quality journalism, as described in the book by Nick Davis, who will be later speaking about that. The fragmentation of audiences and uh, the risk of, uh, let's say, foxification. That means that you have uh, uh, more and more media that bring truth for their own parish. Polarized media situation as the USA is not really fast uh, to be uh, entered in Europe, but there is a risk. And the fourth one is, the, of course, the new kids on the block, mainly from the USA, loaded with cash, uh, access to global content, uh, using the opportunities provided by the EU, who works on a liberalized uh, media market, and, of course, the changes in the value chain. Second reason, I see a number of public service broadcasters changing from a fortress to a network, at least taking the first steps. And uh, I will not explain too much about what it is. Read the speech Charlie uh, uh, did held two months ago in Hilversum. Um, uh, what is a networked public service broadcaster that's more engaged, <coughs> engaging with the audience? And listen to Sila, who's uh, uh, running uh, Swedish radio, and they are already on the way to this networked broadcasting, I would say. The third reason um, um, is that I see um, the project didn't start, but I, if I take my own uh, knowledge, I see many opportunities, many uh, best practices, many examples where already uh, uh, public service broadcasters have programs that enhance their position as a trusted source. And I would like to share six examples of this. <coughs> I have to say, next slide please. They're from only three countries because, as I say, I just started. They're only from the television sector. I'm sorry, Sila. Um, and um, the first one is a, a nice one, I think. Um, it's from Holland. And the issue here is about opening the newsroom. Um, it's called the Altet Wat Monitor. Oh, there's a clip. It's already started. The Netherlands is a great country, but there's always room for improvement. That's what we want to achieve with the Altet Wat Monitor. A new kind of journalism, an experiment, transparent and interactive. 
The Arte VOT Monitor focuses on important social topics, such as healthcare, education, food and sustainability. These are topics that matter to us all and about which everyone has something to say. The Arte VOT Monitor gives you an exclusive look into our research process. It's a digital and interactive research board, allowing you to monitor the progress of our research live, complete with notes, documents, interviews and open questions. Questions need answers, your answers. With a simple click, you can participate, share interesting reports and videos, send us confidential documents, state your opinion. Everything is possible and the options are endless. But you should be critical too. What's missing? Are the allegations true? Point us in new directions. Because if we work together, we can see the bigger picture. And when that picture is complete, we can eventually tackle and change things. So, observe and participate at the Altaid VOT Monitor. So what you see is a tool, and uh, the interesting thing is that they really uh, involve the audience from the beginning, what topic to choose, till the end, what do we discuss, <coughs> and the follow-up. The next one is about understanding the audience. You recognize this one, this is the crisis in uh, Norway, covered by NRK. Um, as, I, as Charlie said, I come from NOS, which is uh, uh, the biggest news uh, organization in Holland. And um, uh, when it's about trust, of course, in the moment of crisis, that's the, the, the moment when it counts. And, uh, the NOS, like many others, have uh, public broadcasters have a strong position there. But um, um, what we do at a moment like that is that we claim almost all the channels and all the airing time and do our journalistic duty. But I saw at NRK, as far as I understood it, uh, the next level. And that is that um, um, in the first few days when this uh, was aired or covered by them, the focus was more on consolation and connecting with the audience than on the, let's say, the core activity of journalism. The, the, um, and only after a few days the focus changed and it became more first-line journalism. And I think that's a, a level of maturity that, that uh, at least we at NOS can learn from. Understanding the audience as a, uh, a theme. The third one is uh, um, about being self-critical. This is a Dutch program called Media Logica. It started last year. Um, and in my opinion, it's an antidote against a trend you see in many newsrooms, also in ours, to be faster and faster, uh, to give more attention to rumors, to treat politics as a sports event, uh, uh, to uh, uh, point at scapegoats instead of analyzing deeper. And this is journalism about journalism. It's, it's focusing on what do we actually tell and what is actually happening and um, um, it started uh, last year and it brought about some major hypes in a different uh, it put it in a different daylight one of them is uh, a small town I don't know if I have time to explain it but this is about a small town in Holland called Gouda and um, uh, what happened is a few Moroccan guys uh, were fighting with the bus driver and this became so huge in a few days propelled by the media, that in the parliament a lot of political parties asked the government to send the army to Gouda. As it turned out, in a, in a transmission uh, 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 a broadcast by Media Logica, it was nothing more in the end than just a few Moroccan guys hitting the bus driver. So it was, uh, in my opinion, a, a great way of showing that you can be a trusted source to criticize yourself in this. And the fourth one is about attitude towards the audience. I will not go deeply into this because it's not really about journalism, but what it shows is the Swedish corporation, and Sila can maybe explain more about it, that collects the license fee, thanks the audience in a very creative and humorous way for paying the... Uh, license fee. License fee. <laughs> no TV tax. Quite a big difference. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. Um, um, and that's, that's uh, an attitude. It's, it's uh, uh, more service-oriented, it's not humble, uh, and it's the opposite of the arrogance we sometimes have. For example, not answering letters of the audience. 
Um, the fifth one. I have to run very fast. Um, it's about diversity, and this is from a Swedish uh, television company, SVT, public broadcaster, also. Uh, and it's, um, in my opinion, um, uh, the case that the more you are capable of showing different angles and different interests and perspectives on the subject, uh, the better you are and the more trust in the end you will gain. Um, but the question is, uh, uh, how to do that if your uh, audience is changing rapidly and you have a fixed or, or a staff on fixed contracts and you have budgetary problems? And that this is one little tool that uh, uh, could help very much. Uh, SVT did a, invested in a sur survey, uh, surveying uh, their own staff. What convictions do they have? What prejudices do they have? Uh, how do they look on, on, on uh, a lot of topics? And compare that with the survey in the population. And this raises awareness, and I think in the end it will lead to better programming, to better journalism. The sixth one, and the last one. Um, this is a very dull picture in the end. You see one guy, and this is about craftsmanship and courage, I would say. It's a, a, a Dutch program called DB, DWDD University. It's all almost unpronounceable. But um, um, in my opinion, being a trusted source ha brings also the obligation that you bring the big issues of your time, that you do things about economy, very, and not the easy things, that you do things about philosophy or religion, or in this case, science, and that you really try to to have the, the big picture on this. And at the same time, reach a mass audience, because there's the trick. And um, we know that it's hard, but this shows that it's possible. Here you see one guy talking one hour in primetime television <coughs> on the main channel in Holland last spring, one year ago. <coughs> and he did it again in the fall, reaching a mass audience in the first, uh, in the first uh, transmission about the Big Bang and the evolution theory. And the second uh, uh, broadcast was about nanotechnology. It's possible. It's about making good programs popular in the end. Well, this was a, uh, two more slides. I will skip this one. Time up. Time up. Shall I explain why I have a horse here? Or not? <laughs> uh, just leave a bit of mystery in there, not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have got on Moves around all, uh, pretty much all day, aren't you? You're sticking with us. Yeah, so by all means, come and talk to me afterwards because there's that's about fascinating research that he's doing at the moment. And I will save some time by clicking this myself, I think. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, the key word for this conference is trust. The key word for public service future is definitely trust. As Ruth was telling you, public service in Europe is under a lot of pressure. In some countries it's political, in some countries financial, and unfortunately in some countries both. And I think, as a director general, that if we can create trust, trust among our public, trust among our audience, then it's much, much, much harder for people that want to harm us to actually succeed. So how do you create trust? Well, of course, there's not one single recipe, but one thing is for sure. You have to set your priorities. The first priority you have to do has to do with the content. You have to decide actually what to produce. What is public service in the future? For Swedish radio, that is mainly five priorities. It's foreign coverage, sending people outside of Sweden with Swedish eyes. It's real local presence. We have 25 local stations that are broadcasting the whole day. It's news and current affairs, especially investigative journalism, original content. It's culture outside of the big cities. And it's also, of course, to make the radio digital. Because it's not enough that you set your priorities for your content, you also have to set your priorities on how to reach your audience. Public service companies in Europe has been, and are still, in some way, quite snobbish, if you ask me. 
we say that we are so damn good, so you have to come to us. Either listen to us at FM, look at us at television, or at least come to our web pages. Two years ago, we changed that attitude at Swedish Radio. Our main mission is now to get the content to the audience, to get the conversation going. One example on how we do this is we have an embedded player that anybody could put on their website, also our competitors, also the big tabloids in Sweden. And they do. They put this player on their website and they choose what to put in it. We don't. They can put one entire channel, they can put one entire program, or they can put a segment of a program, like an interview with the Prime Minister, for instance, or with Zlatan Ibrahimovic. And when they do this, we reach a new audience, an audience that wouldn't necessarily come to us, and they get material from public service. We build trust. But we also have to change as traditional journalists, and this is what my session is about. We have to change the way we work. Journalist 1.0, that's me. I've been a journalist since I was 21. Traditional journalist. I know what that kind of story I want to do. Maybe I talk to an editor. I go out. I look for the information I need. I put my story together. Someone is in charge. We broadcast it. Maybe the audience can comment on it afterwards on our website. And I get paid. And someone is liable. Journalist 2.0, that's social media, basically, where anybody claims to be a journalist. You produce, you air it, or you put it on Twitter. If it's right, doesn't really matter, because if, if it's wrong, you correct it afterwards. Everybody contributes. You don't get paid, usually, and nobody is liable. And the future, if you ask me, is journalism 3.0. If we, as traditional journalists, don't realize the fact that social media is out there. If we don't use it for our benefit, then we will be out of business. So journalist 3.0 is a two-way true dialogue with your audience. It's not abdicating. It's not handing over the microphone, letting other people do your job. You still have to be the journalist who is evaluating facts. But you have to have a dialogue with your audience, <coughs> read audience participation before you start to do your job. Already at the morning meeting in the newsrooms, already before you start to make your documentary, or already before you start to host your morning show. To be able to do that, there will be an increased importance that the staff has some nice personalities, otherwise people will not want to have a dialogue with them. And we have to be skillful, and we have to, be, have, to have a great deal of knowledge Authenticity will be all more important. And there will be a more emphasis on local matters because local matters are closer to people's heart and they will be able to participate more. So we will see an increase in journalistic differentiation. So how do we use this in practice? I will give you some examples from Swedish radio as of 2013. Public network. We started with one public network at one local station up in north to see if it's going to work. At these local stations we have a staff of maybe 15, 16 people and they do radio programs from 6 in the morning until 6 in the afternoon and they also produce on the web. They went out and asked the pub public, do you want to contribute? 300 people signed up in the first phase. 300 people are now contributing in the morning on what kind of topics should they cover during that day. They don't decide, but they send in the message. This is going on in my neighborhood, or in my school, or in my workplace. We have four daily news reporters at this radio station. Of course, the variety of news is this much bigger now, when 300 people are participating instead of the same four every morning. And then you can also use these people for interviews or for knowledge if you need it. We are now uh, rolling this out to all the 25 local stations. It's a big, huge success. The other example is called the Earth. It's a social science program. Heavy science in our P1, which is a speech-only channel for mature people with a high degree. It starts on the internet. It starts as a blog. Science people from, from all over Sweden are participating in a debate on the blog 
and then a reporter and an editor chooses the topic that is of most interest for people and they make a radio program afterwards. So it starts with a discussion from qualified people from the audience on the internet and afterwards we do the radio program. The third example is quite easy. Everybody in our newsrooms should be on Twitter. It's not an option. And it's not, as we were hearing in the first session, to actually promote our news. This is not what Twitter is all about. Of course, you can do that also. Twitter is a tool to get information, to get news, to get new sources, to get new people, to get people that would never be aired otherwise because you wouldn't know that they existed, and you find them on Twitter. Then, of course, two sources on Twitter are not good enough to do a story because Twitter is not only, all, always reliable and not always correct, but it's a very good tool. If you're a public service company, you also have to pay and play a certain role within a democratic society. And I will show you now the example on Journalism 3.0 that I'm currently most proud of that we have produced. We have had a debate for several weeks in Sweden about <coughs> what kind of words are okay to use without being called a racist. This debate was taking place mainly in the parliament among white middle-aged people or on the editorial pages of the newspapers, also white middle-aged people. We have an urban station uh, in Stockholm, and they thought, let's turn the question around. Let's go out and ask the people that are receivers of these words how it feels to be a receiver of a racist remark. They produced this little video, even though we are a radio company, and they placed it on YouTube. Frustration, ilska. Man vaknar, loggar in på Twitter, på Facebook, kollar mejlet. Boom. Boom. Där är det. Det känns som att man reser tillbaka i tiden. Man måste vara förberedd på det liksom. Jag får blackout. Man tänker att en gång är ingen gång. Fast det är ju det. En gång är ju en Sa de vad jag tror att de faktiskt sa? På gymmet. Fika pausen i skolan. På ett möte. Klok här. När man promenerar på totalen så hör man något. Säg, säg igen. Säg vad du menar. Du kan få låtsas att du är svensk, men du är ju inte, inte det. Neger. Invandrarjävel. Svarsköller. Apa. Gurdjävel. Lakrisk troll, nu vad jag menar. Och hem till ditt land. Och svartbil. Så sitter man i mig. Jag har inte kommit längre. Det här är på allvar. På riktigt. Enough is enough. Det räcker med. So this video was not only placed on YouTube, it was also placed on our website. Uh, the traffic increased by 200%, but most importantly, they also created a hashtag on Twitter. And through that hashtag, they got 600 stories within the first three days. 600 stories from ordinary people out there who actually told them their story, how it felt to be a receiver of a racist remark. And out of these 600 stories, they made radio programs for an entire week, and they turned the whole debate around in Sweden, and it was a big uh, debate also in Parliament about this, this video. So this is a way how public service can build trust, because these people hardly knew that Swedish radio ever existed before we did this story. So this is a very good example, I think, of Journalist 3.0, because I think that the biggest threat towards us are two. One is that people, other people, take us for granted, for instance, politicians, so they don't give us the funding we need. But the second threat is that we take ourselves for granted, that we have such a good position, that we are so qualified, <coughs> that we forgot to change with the environment around us. And if we don't do that, we will not be able to keep these figures that I'm also very proud of. These are trust figures released by the European Commission. Radio in general is more trusted than television, more trusted than the press for sure. And as you can see, Swedish radio is the most trusted radio company in Europe. But we have to work on it. Thank you. Fantastic. And again, um, Scylla, I, I believe, is not going to rush off immediately after this. So if you want to follow up um, on the, the range of stuff they're doing, which is fascinating, then I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to people. But bringing it back home <laughs> to the BBC, Trisha, can you, 
He's going to give us a couple of examples of, of that kind of stuff, but you know, from the cold face, actually working in, uh, in the newsroom of the BBC, trying to handle some of this social media stuff. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, actually, I'm probably just going to show you one slide. <laughs> um, and I just want to focus around maybe one example which will hopefully um, give you a sense of the sort of stuff that my team does. Um, as Charlie mentioned earlier, the team I work in um, is called the UGC and Social Media Hub, uh, embedded within the BBC Newsroom. It's probably the newest team, one of the newest teams in the BBC Newsroom. It's been going for about seven years, um, and I've been part of the team for about the last five or so. Um, and as the name suggests, our main um, area of activity is uh, dealing with content, UGC content, that gets sent into us directly by BBC News audiences, uh, but also uh, going out into the wider web onto social media, finding content, uh, looking at it, checking it out, and then trying to get the best of that on air. Um, I personally find this issue of trust really, really interesting. Um, and I think one of the things that I particularly notice in the work that we're involved with, that where trust really seems to magnify is when you can combine a few factors. One is um, the diversity of the sources. Um, Mary Hockaday, for, for those of you here, she was grilled a bit on the issue of diversity in the BBC. And I think one of the things that's probably missed in this diversity uh, debate is how diverse are the sources that you are looking at in terms of trying to find news. And I think one of the things that I'm very lucky with in terms of the team that I work in is that that is effectively what um, our reason for existence is, to try and go to as many different sources as possible. And you know, the audience is a fantastic source uh, uh, in their own right, away from the, sort of the official government agencies and experts and institutions that uh, normal journalists uh, go to for content uh, and information. Um, and then social media is another big example of where we can get uh, amazing potential leads, stories that we can then um, ingest into our own uh, newsroom conversations and get them onto our bulletins, onto our website, onto our radio programs um, as quickly as possible. So diversity of sources I think is a key aspect of trust. I think speed of editorial judgment is increasingly, increasingly a vital part of any news organisation. Um, and the third aspect I guess would be the delivery um, of what we have discovered and our new stories to all the different platforms. Sila talked about the different ways that you can get your content out and I think that's a very, very important part. You know, you could be doing great journalism, but if no one knows about it, then there's little value in it. Um, so those are the three areas that I think are increasingly becoming important in the way uh, news organisations and individual journalists themselves uh, deal with um, the very rapidly changing world that we're in. So I just want to talk about one example as, an, as, as a way of giving you a sense of how my team works. Um, before I play this video, it's, it's slightly uncomfortable viewing, um, but if it helps, um, the conclusion that our team reached was that it was um, a, a setup. Um, now, this is a video that was doing the rounds uh, on Twitter, um, I think in the summer of last year, uh, at the a period when the coverage of Syria was at a sort of heightened level across um, many news agendas. Um, and it's probably one of the most complex stories that I can think of that my team, but also the wider BBC newsroom, has ever had to deal with. Um, and the context around this video was that um, it was gaining a lot of chatter and buzz on Twitter and Facebook at the time. Um, and the chatter around it was that um, this was a video of a Syrian activist who had been captured by um, Assad's men um, and was being buried alive in a hole. Uh, as punishment for uploading video uh, onto YouTube. Um, and I, I noticed that morning when we started picking up on this chatter that it had already been retweeted and shared and commented on by quite respectable Middle East correspondents as well as a few <coughs> news organisations. And one of the key tasks that uh, the head of the BBC News foreign news gathering had given us was to try and look into this a bit more and see if we can get, uh, assess some sort of credibility because if it was genuine then BBC News was quite uh, understandably very keen to broadcast it. Um, so, a moment of judgment, see if this video actually works. Ma'aum, 
नमस्ते हर कल भाग बादुरे का भी नहर हैवान है बस नमस्ते ये हैवान मरुई आने को मरु मरु आने को हैवान Um, so apologies again if you found that uncomfortable viewing. I know it's not an easy wa uh, easy watch, um, but when we looked at this video, there are a few, th there are a couple of key things that made us question whether this was a real video or not. Uh, just out of interest, any thoughts on what you've seen? Would, would there be any alarm bells that would ring? Yeah. It cuts out suddenly at the end. Yeah. It doesn't run on. Definitely, that was one of the key things. Um, the other thing that we've, we were slightly suspicious about was that this is a guy who's being buried alive. His, his um, mouth is sort of uh, under a lot of dirt. But the audio seems very clear. Um, of him shouting and screaming and being and and um, the translation that we checked out, uh, he, you know, he was sort of giving a bit of a narration as to what you know, um, it's not sort of what happened to him, but sort of begging and pleading and, and so on. Um, and so there, were, and that was the second uh, key thing that it cuts out the minute his head is covered, um, which again made us a little bit suspicious that you know was this a sort of a setup um, and. Those were the two sort of initial questions we had, which was enough at the first stage of sort of checking out that we were um, passing the message on to the newsroom. But can you, um, you know, we want to do some more checking on this video. We've got some things that we need. We're not quite sure about. Um, and where I think we, as a news organisation, are very lucky um, that we have access to a lot of great expertise within uh, the newsroom. And so. I managed to get in touch with um, a, one of the people at BBC Monitoring who's a Syrian specialist, he himself is a Syrian, um, and also a couple of people from BBC Arabic to take a look at this video as well. Um, and during the process of that conversation, one of the other things that emerged very quickly was that there had been number of, a number of cases that had been spotted um, where videos had been um, proven to be fake during the course of the Syrian conflict, from both sides, from activists, but also from uh, Assad's men as well. Um, and that, again, you know, rang another alarm bell um, to want us to look at this video in a bit more detail. Um, at this point, um, I just sent out a tweet uh, on, um, on Twitter just telling the, anyone who was interested on Twitter that we had some suspicions about uh, this video. Um, and pretty much, uh, you know, within a few minutes of me sending this tweet out, other people on Twitter started um, picking up on this as well. Um, and very soon, I, we noticed one guy actually did an audio analysis of the actual audio file and noticed some um, discrepancies in the way the audio um, appeared to be potentially mixed together and layered um, on top of the video. Um, other people um, also um, helped with looking at sort of interrogating the original source of this video. Whilst a number of sort of well-known Syrian activist channels had tweeted this or put it, posted it on their Facebook channels, when we look back to the original source um, account that was uh, posting this, it wasn't a source that we were familiar with during the course of the previous sort of year where we'd been looking at these various social media sources and began to um, sort of understand the credibility of different accounts and who was uploading them, who was behind them, and what sort of stuff they were uploading. Um, we did more checking again, um, and w one of the, um, the guys at uh, BBC Monitoring you know, confirmed a few things for us, that actually the accents do check out. They're Alawite accents, which are traditionally the um, tribe that uh, Assad's uh, military come from. Um, and he also said, um, we, we were a bit unsure, so why these guys got trainers? Is that sort of proper military uniform? And he also said, well, actually, yeah, it's quite common for a lot of them to wear trainers rather than army boots, because trainers are a lot more comfortable, and the army boots are really crap. At, you know, you know, doing the job that they need to be doing as soldiers, um, and so that made us think um, that if it was a setup, it was potentially a setup from the As Assad side um, of the conflict, where they potentially wanted to try and set up a video which may have acted as a sort of a warning shot um, to activists to stop uploading videos and sharing content on, on social media. We've come across similar examples from the other side where 
potential abuses by Assad's men have been faked. And there was one example that we'd come across of a boy that apparently was being beaten by uh, a boot by men dressed in Assad's uh, army uniform. But when we actually looked at the video in a bit more detail, frame by frame, we noticed that the boot kept missing him, and it wasn't actually hitting him. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's stuff that you wouldn't obviously notice unless you're really you know, looking at, at it with that level of, sort of forensic analysis or, uh, or applying that level of judgment. Um, and so I guess this is just an example of, of many, many different types of examples of the types of techniques that we use. And I think the key message, um, if I can leave you with, is that um, lots of great tools are emerging all the time that help us technically to uh, interrogate data in terms of whether it's pictures or videos, the source of original content, the geographic location that it was uploaded, the credibility of particular accounts. But it's really important that you combine that with your own journalistic expertise, your journalistic judgment. And I think that, as has been mentioned earlier, where in many ways um, trust is actually a growth industry in journalism. And that's something that's really important for us as journalists to be aware of, that this is something that we can contribute to this wider conversation in social media. My instincts, not based on real evidence, but my hunch is that as the chatter reaches deafening proportions in social media, as more and more people start joining these conversations, what will really um, be of great value within this uh, ocean of chatter is real um, nuggets of truthful analysis and journalistic judgment, which we as journalists, I think, can provide. So I'll end it there. So, uh, because they're all incredibly um, sure. good at editing themselves, <laughs> which you'd expect from the senior journalists like this, We've got a little bit of time for some very quick questions, if people want to ask any questions very quickly. Um, hello, my name is Nazmi Nasser, I'm a running journalist. Uh, regarding your emphasis on social media and trust, number one, uh, how, how uh, are you, um, can you be confident about the sources on social media? Because certainly the Iranian media, people that I cover, a lot of them have multiple identities. That's number one. And number two, how can social media, I mean, about the age range, what is the age range of the population and what diversity is there in the social media so that Twitter itself can become, is it a real uh, reflection of the society at large? Yeah, good question, Salah. Well, the second question first. Uh, uh, Twitter is not a reflection of the audience at all, I would say. It's one tool. But social media is so much more than Twitter. Uh, Facebook is another tool, and at least in Sweden, it's now becoming the main uh, place for people 50 above and not for others. So uh, the young people are leaving Facebook for Instagram and other places. So uh, I think you have to have a spread and a ver variety. Uh, the second, uh, or the first question, uh, what we did at Swedish Radio is that we published actually internally a social media handbook. Uh, which is a guideline uh, for everybody working at Swedish Radio on how to use social media, all the different types, but also what to think of, how to verify your sources, uh, and, 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 uh, and what your responsibility is. Because this is really important, and that's why I was saying at my session that two sources on Twitter are not two sources, there are two people on Twitter, and you still have to do your journalistic work. And the lady who's actually in charge of this handbook, she just came into the room, she's standing over there with the red hair, so if you want to ask her any more about the social media handbook, please feel free to do so. And we also have it as a PDF in English if you want to download it. Yeah, just to add what Sula was saying, you know, I think it depends very much what the social media platform is because they tend to attract different age ranges and also different audiences. And I think we, there is a danger that we quite often um, just fall into the trap of the sort of the Western established social media accounts as well in terms of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. But, you know, if you're in China, very few people use those sorts of accounts. And I think there's as much importance of understanding your sort of potential audience and where they are in the world. Um, and so I think it's very important that we constantly stay on, stay on top of, you know, understanding the differences in these platforms and what those potential audiences are. Um, and uh, I guess, yes, yeah, so what was the second point, you, or the first point? The age range and yeah. the multiple identities. Yeah, and I guess that issue of checking sources, you know, that as an activity has been, you know, a part of a journalistics core skill ever since journalism first started. And so I think the only thing that's changed is just making sure that that activity um, <coughs> is just updated and refreshed, and just by having awareness of the technology and the different sources that are available now. 
Anyone else? Quick one there. Yeah, I. Uh, Nash, I'm a human rights and television student at Kingston University. Uh, I think all the social media we've been talking about it is there's a, a target in the, 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 the cities of the European country rather than refugees and asylum seekers. I give you an example when I was doing my research in Sweden, Malmo, one of the cities, about uh, immigration coming from Syria, Iraq, rest of it. They don't have any access to Twitter, Facebook, wherever, wherever. So the only option was there, the, 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 the match is like a black hole system. They target them, they, they, they recruit them, and I, I found out there's a, a huge barrier, a gap between our origin Swedish and the people who are coming there because they're not uh, familiar with the language, they're not familiar with their, with their culture. So, so I, I found out that all those media we've been talking about that are not affected. They're not, they've been isolated. It's not just a case of Sweden. Even here, or in Poland also is the same. So, so, so uh, my suggestion is that, that the social media could be, could be part of targeting those to integrate them to society, to feel them they are exist, to feel them they are part of the, the new life. So the new life need a, a, new, a new recruitment of how to engage them with others. It's a very interesting point, and I suggest that you talk to Yasmin, which is the researcher sort of referred to, who's going to be talking later at 12.30 about precisely that issue. It's a really fascinating issue about how you reach you know, different communities within a community. I'm going to take another question as well. Hi, my name is Wojtek. I'm just curious what your thoughts were about the role of public broadcasters to create content in English for foreign audiences abroad. Um, I'm myself from the Czech Republic. I know radio, the Czech radio does some of it. Um, BBC obviously does a lot of it. I'm just curious if I'm not sure if in Sweden you do that uh, for those living in Sweden that might not be from Sweden, but also for those living abroad. Well, first of all, we have five minority languages in Sweden that we are obliged to do, so we do, uh, gladly so, also I must say. And then we have some immigrant languages. We do uh, Arabic, we do Somali, we do Pashto. Uh, and we do uh, Al Albanian, uh, and that's because most of the immigrants in Sweden are coming from those countries. Uh, and we also have a daily <coughs> broadcast in FM on English, uh, and we also do English on the web, Russian and German, and this is also distributed all over the world. So. Okay, one last question, anybody? No, 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 yes, go right, right at the back, shout out. Uh, yeah, this is <laughs> You mentioned the fact that um, one of the core um, things that you make about in that case is that during the test, uh, during the test, they were able to console with the audience. But my question is, the basic tenet of journalism is that we need to displace ourselves from the story. If you are consoling people about um, violence, are you not actively participating in the story? Hmm. Good question. Really? Did you get that? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think the question is, uh, do you um, uh, not perform your job well if you are about consolation and not about journalism? Is that what, what you're saying? Or even just being engaged at all when the story is sort of still happening and playing out. If you're crowdsourcing and responding and interacting, are you losing your objectivity, I guess? Yeah, well, I, I think in this case, the, the it's, it's a case-by-case -case approach. I think this strategy uh, took place in a, a few hours' time. And then it was about mourning uh, uh, on the one hand and about the question why and what has happened on the other hand. And the point that I was making is that in this specific case, the balance between, let's say, uh, hardcore journalism and being uh, um, a, a square where the whole Norwegian population could mourn about what happened. The, I think NRK was really aware of that they needed to find the balance in this. And what I, the point I tried to make is that yeah. I come from a culture where the reflex is we need to do journalism and we sh push anything else aside. And, and my point is think about the balance. And, and of course you're right, if, if the story is still developing while you start transmitting, then you choose maybe a different balance than in this case. But it's, what I try to make the point is, be aware of what it does to your, to your audience and reflect on this, not only in a, always a journalistic way.
Okay. Listen, we're going to have to stop it there because we ran out of time. But what I just want to let you know is that the next session here, we're going to have a break now for half an hour. The next session here at 11.30 is it, basically the theme goes on. It's about skills for the future. So we've got people talking about what kind of skills do you need to put this kind of journalism into practice. And then at 12.30 we've got two people, including Yasmin, who's going to be talking about her research on using social media to reach more diverse communities. And in the afternoon you've got sessions on journalism and data journalism. So stay in the walls and through the day if you want that kind of more practical social media stuff. But don't forget, there's also sessions in the other theatre as well. Thanks very much to our panel. That was fantastic.